it was a very special place. There was a very large room uh, where there were tables, low coffee tables with chairs and many games. And then the officers for the professors and graduate students were um, off from this big common room. And the common room was really a place of mathematical culture. And if anybody was totally associated with the culture from this com common room, it was Conway. The coffee tables had lots of papers with mathematics written on them, but also lots of equipment for games. So there would be cards, there would be a board of backgammon, I think is it tafla, you call it in Turkish, played with dice, and also a board or several boards for the Japanese game of Go, which will appear a little bit later in our story. Also at this time, Cambridge was a very important center for group theory. And there were three group theorists very active in Cambridge at that time. There was John Conway, and we'll of course talk about his contributions to the theory of groups later. There was John Thompson, the Fields medalist, who came from Kansas in America and spent quite a lot of time in Cambridge. And there was John Wilson, who worked on infinite groups. And sometimes we would be sitting in the common room there was a telephone there and the telephone would ring and one of the wise would be calling, can I speak to John? And of course, anybody who picked up the phone had to ask, yes, which group theorist do you want to talk to? So let's go to the next slide. And I will start with a little bit of the family history, obviously an important part of the man. So John Horton Conway was the son of Cyril Horton Conway and his wife Alice. Uh, Boyce was her, unmaiden, her maiden name. Cyril Horton Conway for a long time made his living by playing cards for money. And I think this had a very deep influence on his son, John Conway, our hero. I'm not sure whether the transmission was genetic or environmental, but it was certainly a very strong tradition that the father passed on to the son. And later it became difficult for Cyril Horton Conway to make a good living by playing cards. So although he did not really have a formal education, he became a laboratory assistant for a high school in the city of Liverpool. The high school was called the Liverpool Institute and its chief claim to fame is that it was the place where George Harrison and Paul McCartney were students. And for those of you who know the history of rock music, popular music, you will recognize George Harrison and Paul McCartney as two of the group, the Beatles. So at this time, when I got to know Conway uh, at the late 1960s, uh, Liverpool was a very strong center of active British culture. There was another person from Liverpool called Caden Dodd, who may not be known outside of England, but he was a very famous comedian with a uh, very distinctive sense of humor. And he sort of looked like Conway, or perhaps for somebody who hadn't met Conway before, Conway looked a little bit like Ken Dodd. So 
this was something that um, you need to be aware of, that um, John Conway, born 26 December 1937, to this family from Liverpool, at this time spoke with an accent from Liverpool, which was very characteristic. And for those of you who have heard Paul McCartney or John Lennon sing, you'll know this accent very well, because that's the accent in which they sing. John had um, this strong Liverpool accent, and that might have been considered provincial and might have been a disadvantage in most circumstances, but I think because of the contribution of the Mersey Beat, the Beatles, and then comedians like Ken Dodd, there was this very strong cultural influence coming from Liverpool. And uh, so uh, Conway actually was able to benefit from this um, cultural advantage from this Liverpool accent. So um, he was born 26 December 1937. I'll comment about that in a minute. Uh, 1968, um, which is about when I got to know him, I was an undergraduate and um, Conway taught this course on analysis. And I like to joke that the way Conway taught this course on analysis is how I became an algebraist. He made this definition of two things being equal to within epsilon and made that the fundamental concept. And it worked for a while, but later on, it gradually got less and less appropriate. And eventually, I, I, if I remember correctly, he actually gave up on that and went to Cauchy's more uh, widely accepted approach of the absolute value of x minus y is less than epsilon, rather than writing x equals y with an epsilon over the equal sign. So let's just go through a little bit of the family history um, so we can perhaps get past it. Um, Conway, in the 1960s and early 1970s, ended up spending almost all of his time in the common room, in the mathematics department. And in the long term, I think this was rather unfortunate because he saw very little of his wife and he saw very little of his four beautiful daughters, Susan, Rose, Elena, and Anne-Louise. And gradually, Conway got sort of separated from his family, was not able to have the contact with them because of his devotion to mathematics and to the life in the common room. So eventually they separated. Then um, I could already see at the end of the 1970s, a time when I left Cambridge, um, there was a Russian graduate student uh, who'd already been married to one uh, Englishman, uh, Lara or Larissa Queen. She had been a student, graduate student of John Thompson's, and then um, actually talked more and more to Conway and ended up working with Conway, becoming his graduate student. And I'll mention some of her contributions to group theory later on, but the result was that um, Conway ended up marrying her in 1983, and they had two sons, Alexander and Oliver. I won't say much about uh, Conway's contribution to knot theory, but I will just remark here that Alexander, for those of you who know knot theory, you will know about the Alexander polynomial and uh, I believe this is why Conway chose the name and Larissa chose the name Alexander for their uh, first son. So by the um, 1980s, Conway was paying for two families, his original family and then the new family with Larissa. 
And unfortunately, professors at the University of Cambridge were not paid as well as professors in North America. And mainly for financial reasons, I think, uh, Conway was happy to take up an offer that came in the middle of the 1980s to move to Princeton with a much better salary that was able to let him maintain these two families. So in 1986, he left the, uh, his familiar environment of the common room in Cambridge and moved to Princeton and became started there as a professor in 1986 all the way through to his retirement in 2013. I saw Conway occasionally every few years, several times in North America, but uh, was no longer able to follow him as closely. I was able to in Cambridge. So I don't know quite what happened to the uh, marriage with Larissa, with Lara, but anyway, in 2001, he married an acquaintance he met from a cafe in um, Princeton, Diana, and there was a son, Gareth, with that marriage. And she stayed his wife then until Conway died on the 11th of April, 2020. We'll say a little bit more about that. Some of you may have seen uh, many of the reports. But before we leave this family history, I will just comment for those of you who know the Christian calendar that Conway was born one day after Christmas in 1937 and died one day before Easter in 2020. Okay, so that was Conway's human family. But of course, you know, mathematicians have other families through the, what the Germans call Doktorvater, the uh, fatherhood of the doctoral advisor. So let me uh, make this a little bit uh, bigger. This is from the Mathematics Genealogy Project, a site that many of you may know. So this gives the mathematical ancestry of most of the mathematicians. So here is the entry for Harold Davenport, who was John Conway's advisor. John Conway did his thesis in 1964. We'll come to that. And Conway has 130 doctoral descendants who are either doctoral students or students of those students or students of those students. I think there are only uh, currently uh, three generations following on from Conway at the moment. Conway's advisor, Harold Davenport, mainly known for number theory, his advisor is really quite famous, John Littlewood the South African analyst who ended up in Cambridge for many, many years and was the longtime collaborator of Hardy. So anybody working in analysis will know the collaboration of Hardy and Littlewood. And for those of you who like to follow mathematics in popular culture, um, a few years ago, there was this um, movie about uh, Ramanujan and Littlewood actually features in there as well. It's played by the actor, I can't remember his name, who also was the uh, main hero in the other movie, The Princess Bride. I was very lucky. I um, once had the chance to have dinner with Littlewood. This was after the graph theorist, Bela Bolabash, had just come to Cambridge. And he arranged a dinner where he invited Littlewood and uh, also invited me. So it's very nice to have a chance to talk to your doctoral great, great grandfather. I didn't quite appreciate it at the time, but looking back, appreciate it 
even more. Um, I'll also mention that although Conway himself did not get the Fields Medal, one of his doctoral brothers, Alan Baker, did. So Alan Baker, a very well-known number theorist, um, best known for his work on techniques for proving that numbers are transcendental. So extending some of the uh, previously developed techniques for showing that numbers are transcendental. Okay, so let's move to Conway's entry in the Mathematics Genealogy Project. And you will see his doctoral students here. And just as alphabetically, Davenport's second graduate student, Alan Baker, was awarded the Fields Medal. Conway was able to follow this transition, and his alphabetically second doctoral student, Richard Borchertz, was also awarded the Fields Medal. And a little bit later, we will come to the work that led to Borchertz getting the Fields Medal. Um, I'm showing up here, and just as we talked about there being three Conways, John T, John B, John H, so you'll see that our hero, John H. Conway, had three doctoral students called Smith. And I have to confess that I really disappointed Conway. He desperately longed for his three doctoral students called Smith to write a paper together. But that never happened. I had some contact with Derek Smith very little contact with Warren Smith. But at any rate, we never got to write the paper with the three of us that Conway would have loved to see us write. Simon Norton is another name here worth mentioning. Um, he's a little bit younger than me. He, um, in fact, we shared an office in just off the common room in Cambridge. He was a child prodigy. So he started studying at Cambridge, I think, when he was about 15 years old. He worked very closely and very intensively with Conway, uh, mainly in group theory. So a lot of the important results um, coming from Conway School in group theory were done jointly with Simon Norton. And there was an excellent synergy between the two. Unfortunately, after Conway moved to Princeton, Simon Norton was rather left orphaned in the mathematical sense, and he did very little mathematics after Conway left, and actually passed away um, several years ago now. Okay, so let's look at the mathematics that Conway is famous for. Well, we only have 50 minutes for me to talk. There would be enough mathematics to keep us busy for 10 hours. So let me just say now that probably 15 or 20 of the mathematical projects that Conway was involved with that I'm not going to be able to talk about. Any one of those would be enough for a person to become really famous and to get a major established reputation. So I'm going to be really selective. I'm going to pick two of the topics that Conway was most closely associated with and was most proud of. And then the third thing, that he is most widely known for, especially beyond the mathematics community, but he was often uh, personally a little bit, I don't know, embarrassed or reluctant to be so famous for that. But Conway's proudest achievement 
was in connection with games and numbers. So if you remember, we said that Conway's father was a professional card player. Conway was very good at playing various games, uh, with the exception of the Japanese game of Go. But Conway loved to analyze strategies in games, to think about how to win, to become effective at winning games. So the result of this family history of game playing and all these hours, quote unquote, wasted playing games in the common room in the mathematics department at Cambridge resulted in this amazing achievement. It's really an example of how much you can create by induction, starting with nothing. Create a whole mathematical world by induction, starting from nothing. So what is a game in Conway's sense? Well, it's a game with two players, left and right. And it's fully deterministic. So at any game and at any time when left and right are playing this game, the game is at a certain position P. And this position P is specified by listing all the positions that are available for left to play, should it be the turn of left to start from that position P. And also all the positions that are available to play a right, should it be right's turn to play from this position. So all the positions available to left, and on the other hand, all the positions available to right, completely specify the current position P of the game. So this is the analysis of a game that defines a position at any stage of the play. There is an initial position. We'll look at some very simple examples. And then the players take turns. First one player moves, then another player moves. And let's just make clear at the start, a particular player loses if it is their turn to play, but they have new moves that are available to them. In other words, if the collection of moves available to them is empty. If you have no moves available, you lose. And you've got to play, you lose. That is the convention. So let's look at these simplest games. So here is the game zero. Remember we said we build everything up by induction. So this is the game zero in which starting from that position, left has no options and right has no options. So of course, with this game, the first player to move in this game is going to lose. They're presented with this lack of options and that means that they are put in the position of losing. Now I suppose there's a game where at the starting position, left has the option of moving to game zero and right has no options. So here is a little tree picture. Here is a starting position. Right cannot move. There are no branches off to the right. On the other hand, left, if they are going to be the first player, they have the option of moving to position zero. At the next turn, right would have to play. 
position zero, remember right has no options in zero, right would immediately lose. Therefore, this game we are looking at, let's left make a move and then win. So this is given the number one attached to it. So the name of the game is the starting position, the root. So the root here is one, left has a move to zero. In general, G greater than zero means there is a winning strategy for left. G less than zero means there's a winning strategy for right. So the game minus one is sort of the reverse of the game plus one. Now, um, if left were to start, of course, they would have no moves, so they would lose. If right were to start, they have a move, and they can then put left in the position of having to play from zero and therefore losing. So that game is has a negative value of negative one, that's a winning strategy for right. Uh, so these three games we'll actually define later. We'll see those are numbers for a simple technical reason. Um, G equals zero. That's his first game we looked at. Um, in general, G equals zero means a winning strategy for the second player. And then look, let's finally look at this game star. Whoever starts, they have a move. And then they're going to win because the second player will be put in the position of having no moves. So star, it's not comparable with zero in the case of these three first things. And in general, G parallel to zero that means there's a winning strategy for whichever is the first player. Could be right, could be left. So star is not a number. It's not comparable with zero. Well, Conway developed a very um, elaborate theory of these games, of winning strategies, adding games, and so on. But let's just look at special games, which are numbers. So game G is a number, and of course we specify it with the left and right positions. So this is inductive. A game is a number if the union of the two sets of positions, the positions available for left, positions available for right, is itself a set of numbers. And now here's the condition that really separates numbers from general games, each number appearing in GL must be strictly less than each number appearing in GR. So remember that game star that was not comparable to zero, zero, zero. This is not a number because it is not the case that zero is strictly less than zero. Star is not a number. OK, so let's see what numbers we do get. We already saw one. Two can be the number where left has a position of one, or left could have positions of zero and one, and so on. Several ways to give two. Three is where left has a position of two available and possibly also zero and one, but they would want to maximize their strategy. They would play two. And again, right has no options. These are all positive numbers. But now we can have omega. So if there is an infinite sequence of what you would think of as natural numbers here available for left and nothing available for right, well, that's this first infinite number, omega. One half is where left's option is zero and right's option is one. In some sense, one half is the simplest number between zero and one. 
One fourth is the simplest number between zero and one half, one fourth, and so on. So we get all the dyadic rationals like this. Uh, one third, uh, think of all these dyadic rationals that are less than one third and keep getting closer to them. Or on the other hand, for right, dyadic rationals that are bigger than one third and keep getting closer and closer and closer. So that's how we can get rational numbers which are not dyadic rationals. Then we had omega, an infinite number. So we also have its reciprocal, an infinitesimal, uh, zero, and then some decreasing sequence of reciprocals of integers. For example, just take the dyadic uh, reciprocals. And more generally, for any cardinal alpha, so thought of as a set of all smaller cardinals, well, those are put in as the options for left and nothing for right, and that gives cardinal numbers. So you can imagine why Conway was so excited when out of playing games, just restricting by this very simple, these very simple recursive conditions, he created immediately all these different number systems that people have painstakingly built up step by painful step in the usual approaches. You know, first you build the natural numbers, then you get the negative integers, then you get the rational numbers and perhaps the cardinals and then go to uh, non-standard numbers. Lots of steps. Here, Conway was able to do everything all at once, starting from nothing with this very simple idea coming from playing games. And just let me indicate you can do not only create sets, but also algebras. Simplest example is the inductive definition of addition of two numbers. So inductively, the positions for left are GL plus H and G plus HL, and the positions for right are GR plus H and G plus HR. So all the algebraic operations are created inductively. So a wonderful foundation for mathematics from nothing with just a couple of very simple recursive rules, you create everything from nothing very simply. Conway regarded this as his greatest achievement, and I would certainly agree with him on that. The other area, of course, that we've already mentioned, where Conway was justly most famous, is in the area of groups. Conway's main work was coming at the peak of the program of classifying the finite simple groups. A program that had really been initiated by Brouwer when he focused on the idea of looking at uh, centralizers of involutions in simple groups. Centralizers of elements of order two. And you remember we talked about the other extremely distinguished group theorist in Cambridge at the time, John Thompson, getting the Fields Medal for his contributions to the classification of finite simple groups, in particular in conjunction with Walter Feit, the feit thompson theorem, showing that if a group is simple, then it must have even order. So it would certainly have an involution and therefore Brouwer's inductive procedures would start to apply. So to summarize a vast body of work very quickly, classification of finite simple groups has three parts. The alternating groups that most of you will have seen, know that they are simple. Groups of Lie type, which I will just summarize as calling the matrix groups of a finite fields, you know, orthogonal groups, and um, versions of unitary groups and so on. 
and then the 26 sporadic groups which do not fit into these infinite families, the groups of lead type or alternating groups. They started with Mathieu in the 19th century, the smallest Mathieu group, M11, 12, 23, 24, all the way up to the largest of the sporadic groups, which is a puny little group compared to some of the groups of Lee type, which of course get infinitely large, but the monster is certainly the largest sporadic group. We'll talk about the monster in a minute, but for the time being, let's focus on the Conway groups. So this was really the achievement that Conway, that solidified Conway's reputation as a great mathematician. He'd done a lot of good work before that, but he was always plagued by doubts about whether it was good or not. I think once he discovered these finite simple groups that nobody else had discovered before, that's when he was confirmed to, his, to himself that he was a great mathematician. So the Conway groups come from the Leech lattice. This is the um, densest, what we now recently know as the densest sphere packing in 24 dimensions. So think of stacking oranges, packing them as closely together as possible. If you came across 24 dimensional oranges, they would probably taste very sweet. And the densest way to pack them in 24 dimensions would be with this configuration of the leech lattice. Formally, we can describe it by some um, vectors in 24 dimensional real space with integer components. So a typical vector there has um, three in one component and ones in all the other components. So that has a lattice vector of Euclidean length four root two. What Conway showed were, was that there were, amongst other things, there were three simple groups associated with the Leech lattice. What we now call Conway 1, the first Conway group, that's the quotient of the automorphism group of the Leech lattice by plus or minus 1, because that's, um, you know, just applying these scalar matrices that are on there, those are essential. Take the quotient by that. That's the first Conway group, the biggest. And then you don't need to do any um, dividing out. The stabilizer in the automorphism group of the Leech lattice of a lattice vector of length four root two, like a typical example I mentioned, you've got a three in one position and then one's everywhere else. That's the group Conway 2, and Conway 3 is a stabilizer in the automorphism group of the Leech lattice of a vector of length 4 root 3, and that could be where you have, for example, 5 in one component and then 1 in all the other components. So these are the three Conway groups. So Conway has a permanent place in mathematical memory by having one of these uh, three of these 26 uh, sporadic groups associated with him. One less than Mathieu, and I'm sure Conway would have been annoyed by that, but uh, you take what you can get. Okay, so let's look at the monster and Conway and the School of Conway, other major contributions here. So the topic of what is called monstrous moonshine. So the monster simple group is the largest of the sporadic simple groups. The order is roughly 10 to the 54. The order is exactly this product of prime numbers. And in particular, let's look at these last three prime numbers, 47, 59, and 71, their product is 196,883. The quickest way to define this without taking a lot of time, it's the group of symmetries 
of a certain bosonic string theory in physics. And in fact, there are a couple of uh, physicists from Boyazici University who contributed to this theory and did some work with the connections between some of the pure mathematics here and some of the physics. So it's nice that there's a Turkish contribution to this very deep and very central subject. The smallest faithful matrix representation of the monster symbol group has dimension. Well, it's got to be a divisor of the group order. So 47 times 59 times 71. And Mackay noticed this number is sort of familiar. Felix Klein's uh, J invariant modular function, um, J of Tor, um, if we write Q as X of 2 pi I Tor, so sort of like doing a little bit of a Fourier transform, it's Q minus 1 plus 744 plus 196884Q plus and so on. So this number, 196884, of course, that's 196883 plus 1. And there is um, a commutative non-associative algebra, what's called the Grice algebra from Bob Grice, that actually has that dimension. And then the smallest representation of the monster symbol group that comes exactly. It's a group of automorphisms of the Grice algebra. So these amazing connections between um, modular functions in number theory and group theory, that's this topic of monstrous moonshine. And Larissa Queen, uh, Conway's second wife, she did a lot of work on bringing in these connections with modular functions. Also, uh, Neil Sloan, who was uh, Conway's longtime collaborator in the theory of lattices, their wonderful book, Splag, uh, on um, sphere packings, uh, lattices, and groups. That's a classic and well worth his study uh, for people from lots of different areas. Um, Simon Norton uh, was associated a little bit with this, and um, also um, Conway student Richard Borchitz, who really established tightly these connections here and was awarded the Fields Medal for that work. Okay, so those are contributions to mathematics of which Conway himself was proudest. Uh, but outside of the community of mathematicians, is nevertheless best known for his game of life. And I should perhaps tell a story as to where this may have come from. Another of the mathematicians around the common room in Cambridge was Frank Adams, a very distinguished topology, topologist. Um, most famous for his result on vector fields on spheres, showing that the only spheres topologically that would sustain a non-vanishing vector field would be in dimensions one, just going around the circle, three, uh, coming from multiplication of quaternions, and seven, coming from multiplication of octonions. So a topological theorem that limits the division algebras that you can have. Conway sort of hated this. He did a lot of work uh, later with his student Derek Smith on um, quaternions and octonions from an algebraic point of view. And he was sort of annoyed, I think, that a topologist had to do topology to limit the algebra. Uh, not only that, Frank Adams was a very fit, physically, rather intimidating, personally kind of person. I was once in a lecture that he was given, and he um, made a some unfortunate student asked, what are the vit vectors? 
And Frank Adams said, oh, good God, man, surely you know what the Witt vectors are, and crushed the student. So Conway was well aware that Frank Adams was this intimidating person, and he confessed to me that he was always just a little bit afraid of him. Uh, there's a transitivity to this relation because when we were having a virtual wake for Conway after he passed away, uh, Richard Borchert, his um, most distinguished student who had the field, has some Fields Medal, also confessed to being um, a little bit scared of Conway. And so I told Borchert about um, how Conway was scared of Adams, and I don't know, maybe this made him feel a little bit better. Anyway, Frank Adams was also into Oriental culture, and he was a very good Go player. And Conway never really learned how to play Go and certainly never learned how to play Go well enough to be able to beat Frank Adams. So Conway sort of played around instead with a Go board. Uh, he invented this game of philosopher's football, P-H-U-T-B-A-L-L, -L, sort of like a version of checkers or drafts, but um, you score goals uh, like in football. But the greatest thing that came out of Conway's inability to beat Frank Adams in playing Go is a much better game that you can play on a Go board, the game of life. So just like with Conway's numbers, a couple of very simple recursive rules create amazing things out of almost nothing. So let me just summarize the rules here. So if this was on a go board, we're looking at a little piece of the go board. The ones are where you have the black stones and the zeros are where you do not have the stones. A, um, if you have this position with one stone and then two or three neighbors, the stone survives at the next move. So the clock ticks and that stone that has two or three neighbors survives. That's one of the rules, the survival of stones, which at the start of the clock tick have two or three neighbors. If you're adjacent to two or three neighbors, you survive. Otherwise they die. Now let's look at this central cell, it's dead. There are no live, there's not a stone there, it's not live, but it has three live neighbors, and they could be anywhere around the circle here, but let's suppose they're like this. Then this is just the second and last of the rules, well, um, almost the last of the rules. Uh, so a cell is born under that situation. So like human families, we need two parents. Here in Comet's Game of Life, you need three parents. And then the final rule is that no other cells survive. So very simple. Um, you're not creating too many new cells at any given time, and you're not destroying too many cells at any given time. It's just at the sweet spot. And the result is that if you keep iterating this, according to um, Saniswa's Ulam, Saniswa Ulam's um, definition of a cellular automaton, you create amazing patterns. And you can see all these. I, I'm not going to show you animations. There are lots of those available out on the internet. But most significantly, patterns that you get can implement Turing machines, can implement universal computation. Uh, and in particular, in 2001, Paul Rendell created some very nice um, actually um, exhibited concrete way to create Turing machines with the game of life. And Conway's game of life, uh, to implement that, that's a standard um, exercise in computer science, very good one. And then there's a meta exercise. Um, if you take Rendell's implementation of a Turing machine in Conway's game of life, this Turing machine is universal. And so you can use it to implement one of your implementations of Conway's Game of Life. I haven't seen that, 
nor have I seen anybody using Conway's Game of Life to implement a Turing machine to implement Conway's Game of Life with a Turing machine, that, and so on. So this wonderful world that Conway created for us out of not being able to beat Frank Adams at the game of Go. Finish with a few quotations from Conway, characteristic. I won't do the Liverpool accent. I'm not from Liverpool. You know, people think mathematics is complicated. Mathematics is the simple bit. It's the stuff we can understand. It's cats that are complicated. Another one which I really took to heart. If everybody else is running north, then run far south as fast as you can. Uh, this is why being a graduate student of Conway, I did not end up classifying finite simple groups. I ran south and got into uh, quasi groups. So I ran south as fast as I could. So maybe although I didn't work in Conway's areas, I implemented his philosophy as expressed by this wonderful statement. Another typical one, he gave up trying to find matching pairs of socks. He was always uh, rather scruffily dressed. He just went out and bought 28 identical pairs of socks. And the story he told afterwards was they thought I was running an orphanage. And the final quote from a um, recorded interview with his biographer, uh, Schoban, who, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, was not really a mathematician. Um, so someone was suggesting that the number uh, that shows up in the monster is arbitrary. Oh, no, it's not arbitrary. It's got to be 196,883. So I hope you've seen enough to understand that comment. And I'll finish with a photograph taken by um, Tanya Hovanova in 2019 of Conway in the uh, Parker Rest Home. He'd had several um, health problems of various kinds, both mental and physical, towards the end of his life. Spent the last year in the Rest Home. It should have given him protection, but unfortunately, with the COVID epidemic, a rest home like that was about the worst place to be. Let me give you a quote again from a recorded interview. This was when Conway was talking about the monster and he was referring to the um, diagram for generators and relations of the double cover of the monsters. But now if we think about a COVID virus, we can give perhaps another interpretation to it. So what Conway said was, sometimes you see a Christmas tree or ornament which has a number of spikes hanging out of it. And when I heard that, you know, after the COVID epidemic, of course, I did not think about the diagram of generators and relations. My immediate association was with a um, coronavirus. And the other thing which I think Conway would have liked, remembering the game of life, he apparently died from being adjacent to either less than two or more than three other mathematicians. Okay, so I should finish here. Thank you very much. Take care. And thank you for your presentation, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, dear participants, arkadaşlar, sorularınız varsa çete yazabilirsiniz. If participants uh, have uh, questions, they can write to the chat box. Uh, 